Hi everyone, welcome to the Cultural Center of Cape Cod here in Yarmouth and welcome to our season finale concert for season three for our Cape Cod Chamber Orchestra. I'd like to give a big congratulations to all of our musicians who have made it through a really great year. All of our supporters, thank you for not only making this project happen, but all of the other virtual events we've done this season. I had really not very big expectations when we started our season back in September, but here we are uh, in May recording here in the Cultural Center. It's been, it's, been a great, it's been a great year for us. We are in transition now, looking at the fall. We are very confident and hopeful that we'll be able to get back to in-person concerts. A great way to help support us during this time is to buy a virtual ticket, which you can find information in the description of this video, or go over to our website, capecodchamberorchestra.org. You can donate to us there, you can subscribe to our newsletter, find out more information about our musicians and our organization, and just stay tuned for what's gonna be happening. I am looking forward to finally bringing back live in-person music to Cape Cod. And thanks for everyone who's been with us on our journey this year. So sit back and I hope you enjoy our concert this evening toward the sea. Hope to see you soon.
I've been here for 14 years. I arrived three months after the doors opened in 2007. And uh, our motto is all the arts for all of us. And I said, literary arts? And they said, of course, go for it. So uh, this show that we're in right now, Mutual Muses, sort of sprang out of the desire to make sure the literary arts were well represented here. It has been amazing to work with hundreds of artists like Jackie Reeves and Richard Neal, musicians like you, uh, actors, uh, creatives of all kinds, and uh, this place has really, my soul has exploded here. I have just made a home for myself, and no matter where I am in the world or what else I'm doing, this will always be a taproot for me. I write novels primarily in my life, my other life, uh, but I'm a poet as well. So in Mutual Muses, I am uh, participating as a poet. There's so much poetry, wonderful poetry out there, contemporary poetry, poetry from around the world, and people ought to be able to just enjoy it and take from it what they want to take from it, uh, add their experiences to the equation, and, and not just study it and not dissect it. I would say to anybody interested in any kind of creative pursuit, they should recognize the fact that they are a well, deep and full. And the more they reach into the depths of the well, into the darkness, the more they'll pull up things they didn't expect to find. Uh, talents they didn't know that they had, interests that they just dismissed because they, they were not recognized in school or as children as having a particular propensity. Um, we all have discoveries to make about ourselves and creativity brings those things out. Oh, well, we hope that things will go according to plan and that by August, if not sooner, uh, there will be no restrictions or many fewer restrictions. We will start with live in-house concerts again in June. We have a lot on tap for the summer and the fall. We have festivals coming up. We have a glass show. We have a huge holiday showcase by the Garden Club of Hyannis in November. Everyone's asking, what will we do if we can't do these things? And we're saying, uh, it's a leap of faith. We have to plan and we have to get out there and we have to open our doors again. And people are dying to come back. You know, we've just sold a ton of tickets for the concerts we have on our schedule. We've just begun to promote. People are so thirsty for a creative engagement. As soon as we are safely able to fully reopen and welcome people back in numbers, we will. In 1893, Claude Debussy finished his first and last string quartet. It's hard to really know why he only wrote one. Either he had a terrible time writing for the quartet, or he thought this is as good as it's gonna get, so he only produces one string quartet out of his entire opus of, of music. In any event, we get one of the most cherished pieces of music in existence for this combination of two violins, a viola, and a cello. For our concert, we're gonna be performing the Andantino from the String Quartet for our full string orchestra. Now, this piece of music goes in ebbs and flows in lots of different directions. It's a very introspective, emotional work. It has moments of manic excitement in the middle of the movement, but overall, I'd like to think of it as a very spiritual sort of hymn for Debussy. You may hear elements of jazz. Even in the 1890s, Debussy does two things. He both looks backwards at the past and all of those that had written music before him, and he's also a very forward thinker. And by the 20s and 30s, the French love jazz. It's all the rage in Paris, and it's no surprise. Composers like Debussy and Ravel really created this new French sound, and I think in France, they were used to these sounds and welcomed new innovations in music. I hope you enjoy our performance of the Andantino from Debussy's String Quartet.
I'm originally from Montreal, um, moved here 25 years ago. Uh, but while I was in Montreal, I studied art, went to art school. I studied design um, and started out as a graphic designer. And when I moved here, um, I fell into mural painting and had a commercial business for a number of years. Um, and now I paint for myself and I have a studio practice with a, a studio in Barnstable Village. It's called Chalkboard Studio. Um, and there's 12 artists in the building. And it's a very lively center for art in our little, our little quiet community of Barnstable. So my early experiences in art really began like from birth. I grew up in a family of seven to uh, two architect parents. Um, so I grew up in a household where there was a lot of, a lot of play, a lot of art materials were out. Um, and so I was just always surrounded by art. My parents also had a really great um, art collection. So I had original art on the walls to look at. Um, something I didn't really appreciate until much later in my life, but being surrounded by all of that and having um, older siblings who were pursuing art also were big influences in my life um, for me deciding to go into the arts. Art in the 21st century is as important and alive as it's ever been, and certainly the pandemic has shown us how important it really is. And because we've all lost contact with so much of um, what art brings us. It has made me in particular, but I think I'm hearing it uh, overall and globally, like how much we miss the arts when they aren't there. Um, so it's completely relevant. And I think um, also as a teacher of art and I teach adults, um, I just see people who have gone, they usually are coming to me at the end of their careers and they're recently retired. Um, and they're looking to reconnect with some art that they had earlier in life that they abandoned for practical reasons. And, um, and the value of like being that person that connects them back to their, um, their creative urges and their needs to have that creative outlet is just so great. And I find that um, you know, being the, the conduit for that to happen has been really rewarding and, and people are hungry for it. There's plenty of people out there, I guess, um, that, that want to learn, they want to discover, they want to play again and they want to have fun and, and, and just explore, you know, with, the, with art. In 1981, the environmental group Greenpeace commissioned composer Toru Takamitsu to write a piece in dedication to their Save the Whales campaign. The piece that Takamitsu came up with was Toward the Sea, a work that actually exists in three different versions. The first written in 1981 for alto flute and guitar, the second version which will perform for string orchestra, alto flute and harp, and finally a third version written at the end of the 80s for just alto flute and harp. It's clear that he wasn't really either sure about which version he liked or he wanted people to be able to perform his music in a variety of capacities. His piece is dedicated to Herman Melville's novel, Moby Dick. And in the movement titles for this piece, you'll see references to characters and events and places in the novel. Now, Takamitsu didn't want to point to one specific element within Moby Dick. It's not a literal representation of Herman Melville's words, but he was very obsessed with one particular phrase in the novel. The ocean is meditation and water wedded together. And with that phrase, we get a piece that is really a spiritual representation of Moby Dick. It, it, it ties more into the atmosphere, the environment of being on the ocean. And the really clever way that Takamitsu does this is by inscribing in the piece the word C, S-E-A. Now, if you play piano or uh, sing or play an instrument, you probably know there's a note E and an A on the piano. But what is S? It'd be hard to find that note on your piano keyboard. But in German music notation, E-S stands for the note E-flat. So thus we get the three notes that spell the word C, E flat, E, and A, spelling S-E-A. 
And this is the DNA. It's coded into the piece. We find the word C represented in the flute part, in the string harmony, in the harp part. And it makes for a really interesting way to relate our real world to a musical one. And the result is a really introspective, beautiful piece of music by Takamitsu. I hope you enjoy our performance of Toward the Sea.
I've actually been coming to Cape Cod since I was a kid. I uh, grew up in Maryland, but my, my family used to come here for a few weeks in the summertime. And uh, I was coming to my, my great aunt's cottage in South Wellfleet, and you could see the ocean right from the cottage. It was just an incredible place to go. So it's pretty easy to get hooked on Cape Cod, and I did, and ended up coming back here to, to live and work. So my great aunt, who, who was in that cottage, she was a teacher in New Jersey, but she would come to Cape Cod and um, studied with pretty famous painters in Provincetown and liked to paint a lot. And she actually became quite a good painter. And her paintings were in our house in Maryland when I was growing up. So I was always surrounded by, by art and her paintings in particular. So it was something that wasn't foreign to the idea of being an artist. It was something actually fairly natural for me to think of as something that you could do with your life. You know, I have come to realize that uh, a lot of the art that I like the most and a lot of the art that I try to make myself has some kind of movement to it or is fluid in some way. I often am making things that are maybe feel uh, almost like they're in process, something that is being built or being taken down. Or Nobody's ever, it's never a, a time when everything is completely set, you know? So I like the idea that life is, is, is always moving and always changing, and I like to sort of reflect that in the work, too. Life is very complicated and busy, you know? It's very, it's like dizzying almost how much is going on, the events that happen so quickly, and I think people really crave that sort of space for reflection or poetry or something that just allows their mind to, to process things. And I think artists have, have a great um, central role in, in doing that.